The Introvert's Edge podcast was designed to create a dialogue around introversion, to stimulate a discussion around our disadvantages, how we overcome those disadvantages, and what we consider our introvert's edge. Together, we're finally going to confront the stigma around introversion, showing that we're not second-class citizens. We're just different, and we need to embrace that. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Introverts Edge podcast. I'm ecstatic to welcome our next guest, Denise Duffield Thomas. And she is the author of so many books that have all hit the bestseller list. She is a money mentor and she actually has an amazing boot camp called the Money Boot Camp that she's had over 9,000 people attend. She is a, a superpower and she is an introvert, which as you know, only introverts come on this show. So the focal point for us first is because her number one thing that I heard on one of her podcasts actually that I would absolutely recommend you check out is that nobody believes that she's an introvert. And I will tell you because we as introverts tend to project extroversion on anybody that seems to have a natural ability to communicate let's test that a little bit so Denise thank you so much for joining us well hasn't it been fun having a little chat before we hit record two introverts we had a lot to say to each other didn't we <laughs> well that's it you know and I always I always have a laugh about when people say that as introverts we can't you know talk and, and, and communicate try and get an introvert to stop talking about something that they love or that they really enjoy. And it was, it was really great to connect with you on the fact that you're, you're really your frustration that so many people don't see you as an introvert and that just because, you know, you're on social media and you've, you've got a couple of, uh, you know, you're a seven figure business owner and it is a really difficult for a lot of people that could never imagine being on stage and on social media to really kind of comprehend. So what I want to do, and we'll, we'll get to talking about how you got to that stuff uh, later on in the show, but what I'd really love for you to do is just to, to share a little bit about your kind of introverted um, you know, roots and help us really understand kind of how you, you got to the point where you actually got to be a, a Titan introvert. Well, I didn't know I was an introvert for a a long, long time. And actually it was a really big surprise to me at first because I was a performer growing up. Um, I was a dancer. Um, I worked as a children's performer as well. And so I was used to being on stage, but I always, I thought there was just something a little bit wrong with me and I couldn't quite figure it out. I would go to parties and I'd um, just want to go and sit in the bathroom for a little while. And so definitely as a teenager and then in my 20s, I really started to feel that internal struggle around being around a lot of people. And for me, it manifested as this sense of imposter syndrome. I thought that that was um, stage fright, really. Instead of realizing that it wasn't that, I was just pushing through because the show must go on. And I needed to respect that need for recharging and rest. And so it was just kind of a bit of a shock. And I think I found out um, maybe even in my late 20s, I was you know, always a personal development junkie. I started love reading different personality tests and things like that. And that's when I went, oh my God, I'm an introvert. And I think now it's, you know, I'm completely accepting of that. But it still is a surprise for people because I think of that performing background and also because I'm a really confident person and I think still people have that perception that there's only one way to be an introvert. And for some people, they think it's someone who's very quiet or nervous or shy. And I'm none of those things, but my introversion now is something I really cherish as self-knowledge. That's, that's great. And I actually, I'd like to kind of open up a little piece of what you just said there, because I think a lot of people feel like there's something wrong with them, which I didn't hear with you. I, I heard the imposter syndrome, but then when they discover that they're an introvert, it, it's not a liberation moment, which is kind of what I hear for, from you. It, you. You discovered it, but it didn't stop you from becoming the person you now are, where a lot of people feel like now there's a word that explains why they can't succeed. And I think that you've been able to, to break through a lot of that 
Is it because you had that performance background that you now, okay, I know what it is, I can manage that and move forward, or is it because you were unwilling to let that, de that word define who you were? Well, for me, it wasn't a sense of like, oh, that's why, because really I thought, um, I don't know, I thought I was just really nervous, you know, nervous about public speaking. But actually, I remember one time when I was a kid, you know, when, you know, your parents say, you like, do a little dance for, for everyone or play your instrument or whatever. And my cousin got a new video camera and she was like, oh, do a dance and I'll record you. And I remember saying, you can record me from the back. And it was almost this like real boundary of going, I don't want, I don't need to be the center of attention here. I don't want to, but I'll do it. And I felt like that was the same with every, all of my experiences. I was like, I don't enjoy public speaking. I don't enjoy being on the debate team, but I'm just going to push my way through it. And actually it was, it was a real relief in my children performing um, career where I started to do suit work. So that's when you're inside a costume. Yeah. And for me, I was like, I justified it in going, oh, this is great. Now I don't have to worry about my weight, you know, and, and looking a certain way and keep, I, I was like, this is a really smart way of still being a performer. But now I realized that it was because I almost needed a, sh a bit of a shield. Um, and I think that's why, I mean, how great is it that you and I as introverts, we live in this time where if we want to, we can be performers, we can, you know, help a lot of people, but we have a shield. You know, I'm sitting in my office in Australia. You're in North Carolina or South Carolina. I can't remember what you, what you said. North. And North, okay. And I'm just looking at a piece of plastic, you know, on my computer. And it's, I think it was just that realization of going, oh, I don't like doing things a certain way, but there's always a workaround. Um, and now, obviously, I can do it from knowing that I'm an introvert, but it, I think it just took me a little trial and error to get there. But I never felt like it was a bad thing, for sure. It was, it was a relief, honestly, to have a label. Um, also, one thing that I think is important to mention is that um, I have ADHD, and I was only diagnosed a year and a half ago. And that wasn't a bad thing for me either. That was an immediate relief of having a label to explain, but also a thread of research to, to get more information about how I can thrive. And now just as an intro, I go probably like you, right? I go, I've got a speaking gig, I've got recovery. And it's, it's just in there. Whereas, you know, in, as a teenager, as a performer in my early twenties, I was just kind of white knuckling through it and just forcing myself to do it, even if it felt bad. I think that's a really important point because I feel like a lot of people, they think that they, to be successful, have to behave like those extroverts. And what I'm hearing from you is that you tried that and it felt really uncomfortable and then you found a way to do it in a way that was comfortable for you. And part of that has been about creating, and I'm going to use the word healthy boundaries, because it's not that you don't do uh, interviews, it's that you love the fact that you can do them in this setting. And we had a conversation beforehand around you as an introvert and picking and choosing your times. And at the moment, you're feeling more in an introverted place, which is why you're so glad that you recorded all these videos previously. So I think right. that that's what's really important for people to hear. It's that, firstly, you we're terrible at being extroverts. We're just not. And that's why we feel like we're trying to survive in an extroverted world. But that's only because we're leaning into behaving extroverted. If we choose to lean into who we naturally are, then we get to make choices. We get to set boundaries. And that is, is profoundly powerful. And I know we're going to be talking about, uh, at, in the Quietly Influential Summit coming up, really about how we can set some of those boundaries and how to really, you know, own our energy. And, you know, we had a laugh before we started this really about, you know, some of the things that we felt uncomfortable doing and, and comfortable doing and how we leaned into that. And I'm really looking forward to having a dialogue around you moving away from networking and me, you know, talking about, well, we have to network so we can get out of networking. But what I really want to focus on today is because I just have this general sense that introverts in a lot of ways feel uncomfortable charging, whether they they come from a religious background where they've heard to, you know, for those that are a lot are given, a lot is required, so they feel uncomfortable, or whether they 
just don't feel comfortable charging because they kind of devalue themselves. I know that, I mean, you, you talk about money mindsets considerably in all your work, and I know that introverts have some unique challenges with that. What I would love, and I, I know we've got some specific examples we discussed, but what I would love for you to do first is just kind of really help the average introvert listening to this that, that perhaps doesn't think that there are money hurdles in their head that are stopping them from charging. They just think customers won't pay them what they're worth. Perhaps mm. allow them to, to look at themselves a little bit and do a bit of a self-audit first. Well, that's, I think, where introverts do have an advantage here around this money mindset work because I do think we are naturally good at finding connections and being curious about things and so this is where my money mindset career really started is this curiosity of why we act the way that we do around money and you know you already touched on one right religion so there are so many layers to to our own money mindset it can come from our family our family legacy because sometimes our money mindset issues aren't even of our generation. You know, they've been inherited um, in very, very subtle ways. Um, there's the time and the era that we are born into, what messages we receive about particularly women and money or just money in itself. Then there's our industry that we choose to go into. Different industries have slightly different money blocks. Then there's culture. So I, I love bringing together different groups of people and, you know, you and I are both Australian, but we work in a very American culture, right? 70% of my clients are American, even though I don't live there. Um, but I had a big discussion with my British clients recently in a round table talking about, well, let's look at the values of Britishness and how this could be impacting your money mindset. And one little nuance in that is the, this idea that British people love queuing up. They love politely waiting their turn. How are you supposed to succeed and you know push yourself forward in, in business when every single part of you is wait your turn, wait your ticket, don't surpass other people? And it's those little nuances that really interest me. And this is lifetime work, right? I've been doing this full time for over 10 years and I still find those little nuances. But the key is to understand, connect the dots to how this is impacting us, and then find ways to interrupt that pattern to form new beliefs about what would be possible. And I'll give you another religious example too. So you said, um, uh, what did you say? What was the much? Uh, to whom a lot is given, a lot is required. So what I, I can okay, tell you is I I've that. had people that feel uncomfortable charging or keep trying to help people that have no money, even though they didn't really ask for the help or didn't, what didn't find it that much of a priority just because they felt like because they knew this stuff, they had to share it. Got it. And a similar one, one that I've heard around that, it's, it's more blessed to give than receive. And so if you grow up, you know, all of us grow up in the water of, our, our family history and something like that sounds beautiful and it's a it's something that I live by I, I I believe I mean my tagline for my business is make money change the world and so that's a really strongly held value for me but where we can sometimes take this too far is if you have a receiving problem it's really hard to receive money for something that feels good or that's something that's easy for you or something that's fun. And I really think not only is that, you know, such a pervasive um, problem, one thing I think, I mean, I don't know how old you are, I assume you're a similar age to me, is that those of us who grew up with an analog childhood, we see the relationship between work and money as this one-to-one -one thing, cause and effect. You work, you get paid. You sell an hour, you get paid an hour. You sell a widget, you get paid for the widget. But somewhere along the line, for me, it was when I was literally like 18, 19, where my brain's already pretty much formed my beliefs about money and work. Suddenly, we're allowed to make money and the relationship between work and effort um, and reward is broken. So it's like our brains cannot compute the fact 
that you can work for an hour and, and potentially get paid forever. Like the math doesn't math, you know, and so that's just one layer, as I said, the era that you grew up in. Um, but I think it's, it's just such a key part of entrepreneurs that I see today is that we just can't get our heads around the fact that the effort and reward has no um, discernible equation anymore. I think that's really a really important point, especially for those people that perhaps are, they have mission-based businesses or even, yep. you know, there are a lot of coaches that perhaps don't consider themselves mission-based businesses. But I mean, I'm on a mission to help introverted service providers and predominantly help them realize they're not second-class citizens, that their path to success is just different. And my focus, because I believe there's something really honorable about a, a, a person that has enough belief in themselves, enough talent, enough skill to go and start their business of their own. And I believe those people need to be protected. So because of that, I'm on, on this mission to help these people realize that if they just focus on their functional skill, well, they're going to have a really tough time. They've got to focus on these things outside that may not feel comfortable, but it are going to allow them to have their own rapid growth business. So when I'm on that mission, in my head, I say missions cost money. And missions cost money, so if I want to help as many people as possible, then I need to make money. Now, of course, it, I choose how much of that money gets spent on new content generation, new programs, new courses, and how much gets paid to me. Because in truth, if I don't eat, I'm not going to be doing it for very long. So when you start to get people to understand that, what I find is that's liberating for them because they feel for the first time, oh, you're right, I've got to earn money. And then all of a sudden, they are helping people in a different way and their, their family's asking them for help and they never had before because they're like, well, no, no, you're all over the place. I don't want to ask you for help. Everything shifts. And it's just, this is just one of these factors. And I know you talk about money scripts and you know I had one client that just had a, he had this family experience where his, his mother was amazing, but you know d divorced and struggled. And he's in an Australian actually as well. But she had $100 that she was going to spend on them having just this amazing weekend. And then she lost that $100. She misplaced her purse and she lost that $100 after they got to the location. And for the longest time, this, this guy, John, struggled because any time he felt like he got a client or things were going really well, he felt like it was going to be ripped away from him. And it all traced back to this experience of this happening. So the, I'd love for you to share kind of how these money scripts start and how simple and how irrelevant these things can be that drastically affect the whole rest of our lives. I mean, you're right. Sometimes it is one little thing. And so that's why actually when people join my money bootcamp, one of the first exercises we get them to do is an inventory of their money memories. And what's fascinating is that there are even multiple layers of that because sometimes there are surface memories, but then as you understand more about the nuances and how they've affected you, you'll, you'll see things in a different way, but you'll remember things in a different way too. So I would say that even like before kind of conscious memory, a, a, a money story that we all share, those of you, us who grew up again in an analog, uh, like paper currency, you know, physical currency world, the same thing that I did to my daughter. I gave her 50 cents at the market and said, go buy an apple. And I was like, look at me teaching my kid about, you know, spending her own money. I was like, yay. And she went to put it in her mouth like all kids do. And I said, oh my God, don't put that in your mouth. Money's dirty. And not only was I saying money is dirty, but I was really visibly upset and her whole body, she was like this. And I went, oh my God, we've all had that experience. We've all had that experience of being shouted and yelled at and a real nervous system jolt. And I would say that's something that, you know, most people share because that's what kids do, right? They put, <laughs> they put money in their mouth. And in that moment, I realized that, you know, you have to deal with that nervous system fear, that real like primal thing of getting into trouble around money. And then everyone's stories go off in slightly different directions. You know, some people have um, self-worth issues because they heard their parents fighting about alimony and child support. Some people have trust issues because someone stole their money. 
Some people have self-trust issues because they lost money, exactly as, as your friend. I've heard that one so many times. Some of us have this vague feeling that something bad is going to happen because we've seen, um, you know, divorce or fights or things like that. Um, and some of it's just so, you know, primal. I hear from people that they have guilt around money and ease because they have, you know, grandparents who lived through atrocities or didn't survive. They almost have this thing of, well, who am I to have this beautiful, easy life? And so <laughs> it really comes down to, you know, I have to work really hard to make money. It's not safe for me to have money. And um, especially when you were mentioning about the different industries and mission, I, I meet so many people who feel like they can help people or make money, but never both. And, you know, sometimes I'll have people and they say, well, that's great. I love your money mindset work, Denise, but it's different in my industry. You know, I work in the um, female pelvic floor industry. I'm a dance teacher. I'm a naturopath. Um, you know, I do this, this and this. I'm not, I can't just charge what I want, but it really does come back down to those early experiences. And so that's why so much of the pattern interrupting work that I do is Yes, to acclimatize yourself to more money by surrounding yourself with wealthier people and all those th things. But you have to deal with that real basic um, nervous system shock. And that's why I do things like tapping EFT, which, by the way, perfect for introverts, for nervous, for nerves. But things like that tapping can can kind of reset your nervous system around money because we did most of us didn't have that early good experience we don't associate it with good things yeah i th I, th I think it's really important for people to understand this because look i know that i had many money hurdles as as i grew up and i i actually remember a school project when i was in high school and i made too much money and my principal didn't like that because i made i mean i made thousands of dollars we were supposed to make 50 dollars or lose 50 dollars and I mean, I pretty much put no effort into it. I, I basically bought McDonald's to the school. We were miles from McDonald's and got them to deliver it. And I got a discount. They charged a small amount higher. And I got called into the principal's office for making too much money. And all of a sudden, I, I had this feeling about, OK, if I make too much money, that's a bad thing. And also that things, you know, the shoe could drop at any moment and the money I made could get taken up because the, the middle ground that we agreed on, well, I just donated the money to Ronald McDonald House and then bought him a receipt. I think he wanted me to give him the money to the school, but you know, I found a compromise I was comfortable with. But I lived with that along my entire life. And I think that this concept of money is the root of all evil, you can't make too much money. In a lot of ways, this gets in the way of the people that truly care about serving others. I mean, I got diagnosed with Erlen syndrome when I was a 16 year old child. And, or teenager, I should say. And it meant that miraculously I could learn to read. And my mother had to look, you know, read every paper and every study she could find to discover this thing called Erlen syndrome. And then they charged me basically nothing, or my mother basically nothing to give me these glasses. I would have loved for them to charge 10 times more because then they could have afforded to spend money on ads or videos that went on social media to get the message out so so many other people didn't have to struggle like I did for so long or perhaps that had mothers a little bit less supportive or fathers that were a little bit less supportive to discover that and I think this is where people get wrong they're like oh I could never charge that or you know I, I charged $20 an hour when I was in an administrative job forget about the fact you got paid every hour where business owners can't because they got to get clients they got to run their business so at best they're going to get a third but they, they still tell themselves I used to get 20 I'm now going to get 25 so what I would love just before we finish up is there's a lot there to unpack and what I really feel for the people that that are listening what would be really helpful is perhaps a little bit of advice on how to come to awareness. I know you talk about forgiving that, but then also how to start the process of kind of transitioning and stop getting in their own way. Oh, absolutely. So I do recommend making an inventory for sure of money memories because I think you start to see themes 
And again, I do feel like introverts are very self-aware people. I think we like to see patterns in things naturally. So I think even just that exercise in itself can be such a big awareness um, thing to have compassion for yourself and say, no wonder, like no wonder I feel this way about money. It's not just how I'm wired, it's how I've been conditioned. So that can be very powerful. Um, An affirmation that I think really, really helps in this is I serve, I deserve. I serve, I deserve, because it makes you realize that um, giving and receiving, it has to be both because otherwise you get stagnant, you get resentful, but also actually you can't help as many people. So when you do things like setting boundaries, working on your money mindset, charging appropriately for what you do, creating passive income products, all of those things, you're doing it to buy back bandwidth, which is way more important to introverts than almost anything else, so you can help more people. Otherwise, your impact is really, really limited to the units of energy that we have. And we have less of that than other people. So we have to embrace those tools if we truly want to help people. And so I serve, I deserve is such a great um, pattern interrupter for anyone who has those guilty feelings. And, you know, just one word on that. If anyone's listening and you work in a nonprofit, so many times I'm, I love giving away money and sometimes even just like there's no donate button on there you know and you could have something that is like it feels good for people to give and it does it feels so good right to give money and so it's almost that feeling too of you know I'm, I'm gifting people the opportunity to to feel good and so sometimes we just have to you know we're good about about not making things about us but it's almost like sometimes we go too far and so we've got to flip it around again to be like I serve, I deserve. Make money change the world. And um, yeah, that's that's going to really help, I think, everyone to get over those money blocks. I think that's really powerful. I mean, I've for always, always said missions cost money. And if I'm going to serve, I need to make money. I love that. I serve, I deserve. I serve, I deserve. And I, what you'll find, and for everyone listening, people that are successful, they tell themselves the things that they need to hear, not lies, the truth. I serve, I deserve is the truth. Missions cost money is also the truth. We're not lying to ourselves. We're reminding ourselves of what's actually important because at the end of the day, I have to make money because if I don't make money, well, firstly, I don't eat, but even to a a higher level, I can't afford to make mistakes. So when I create a product and it doesn't go well, what, that's it, the business is done. Or if I want to go to a conference, I can't, so I can't personally develop myself. Yourself, you have to serve you, you, if you serve yes you do deserve but also you get to serve more because of it I mean there's a study out of the University of North Carolina that uh, talks about the fact that we have to tell ourselves three positive affirmations for every negative thing that we tell ourselves and think about how many times we say money's the root of all, all evil I could never charge that people won't pay that if you keep telling yourself these things you're forever getting in your way I mean there's a Another study that talks about the fact that we tell ourselves 12,000 to 60,000 things a day. Now, if you don't believe that, know that you talk to yourself at you know, the equivalent of an hour's worth of conversational dialogue every, every minute. So you think about how dangerous that is. If you're telling yourself, I don't deserve, I don't deserve, I serve, I deserve. If you can take on those messages and start to reprogram your brain, you will get to serve more people. But you have to remember that if you don't make enough money, you don't bounce and therefore you can't serve anyone. And if you don't make enough money, then eventually you're going to give up because no one loves serving others forever without ever getting some form of stability in in their own life. So Denise and I, we're going to be jumping over to the the Quietly Influential Summit. If you haven't registered for that yet, make sure that you do. You can go to thequietlyinfluentialsummit.com. We're going to go a lot more into, Denise is amazing at setting boundaries and, you know, making sure, and there's a unique story she has about feeling uncomfortable about uh, getting paid to speak, which we're definitely going to get into because that really fits into the she was serving, but she still felt undeserving. So even people that teach this stuff can make mistakes and so we're always learning and we're always growing. So I can't wait to get into that interview. But for today, look, Denise, I know you've got a ton of great resources and, and a way for people to, to 
understand and do a little bit more of a observation of their, their bad money scripts. Where, where can people that are really interested in this specific topic and, and really identifying those, those gaps for themselves, where can they find out more about you and, and how to do that? Well, I'm super easy to find. I'm uh, denisedt.com and at denisedt on all social media. But if everyone goes to denisedt.com slash blocks, um, you'll get a free, you know, a uh, very short webinar about seven specific money blocks of entrepreneurs. And I think that in itself helps people to understand because sometimes people say to me, I don't have any blocks. And all we have to do is honestly scratch the surface just a tiny bit. And there's no shame in that. I have a lot of money blocks that I work on all the time too, even though I make millions of dollars. So um, yeah, denisedt.com slash blocks is such a great place to start. I would definitely check that out to everyone that's listening and check out her books as well. The, I mean, go and look at the ratings. There's just five stars everywhere. And uh, the biggest thing that I can always suggest for introverts, just like Denise discovered probably a little bit too late, I'm sure she would have wished she discovered earlier that she was an introvert because then she could grow from there, not set barriers for herself, but grow from there. If you've got money blocks that are unconscious, they're hurting your ability to support your family. They're hurting your ability to pursue your mission and help others. And they're just making life a lot more stressful for you and everybody else around you. So I would definitely check out uh, those resources. And to keep this energy going, make sure you go to the Quietly Influential Summit. Register for that because we've got some amazing speakers, including Denise, that are going to go deeper into some topics around making sure that you know you absolutely do amazing as, as an introverted entrepreneur. Because look everywhere, there are titan introverts everywhere dominating in all of these so-called introverted arenas. But for today, thank you so much for joining and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Introverts Edge podcast. Cheers, everyone. I'm Matthew Pollard, the author of the Introverts Edge to Networking. I'm on a mission to help introverts to be proud of who we are. For the first time, you'll learn a process for networking that feels comfortable and authentic to you as an introvert. A process that doesn't feel salesy or awkward in any way. I saw at least half of my board members, three in particular that I can think of, that now are so comfortable in literally going up to people at events. All of a sudden, I can see the confidence. Most of the networking books and literature out there really focus on hardcore tactics designed for extroverts. As introverts, we're different and we need to embrace that. We need a system that allows us to channel our natural introverted strengths into the networking room. You will learn how to be successful at face-to-face -face networking and a masterful online networker on your terms. It's beautifully written and it provides tremendous value. So I, I, I am honored to, to say, folks, if you haven't looked at the book, you really need to check out this guy's book. It's, it's excellent. It gives you that confidence to truly be yourself, knowing that you're going to be presenting yourself in a way that is authentic and will also really resonate with the person that you're talking with. One of the things you'll love about the Introvert's Edge to Networking is it's jam-packed full of more than 20 stories of introverts just like you. People that have likely started in much tougher spots than where you are right now and how they've leveraged the strategies that you'll be learning to obtain phenomenal career and small business success. I was about to give up on my business. The results started coming in right away. In fact, a year later, the Chamber of Commerce awarded me the business of the year. <laughs> you need to go read his book because everything he does is what people need, whether they're an introvert or not. I've been fortunate to receive endorsements from some exceptional introverts like Neil Patel and Ivan Meisner, the founder of the world's largest networking group, BNI. What I love about the Introvert's Edge is that it talks about the things that make an introvert successful. The Introvert's Edge to Networking is going to destroy all of the barriers that you have around whether success in networking is possible for you. Now I'm up to kind of five figures, you know, triple my prices or more. It was like the deals just kept coming in and coming in and it, I mean, it was incredible. Like I had never seen anything like it before. I was able to triple my revenue and that happened within six months. We've gone from 10 million a year to 20 million a year. I wrote The Introvert's Edge to Networking after the success of the first in the Introvert's Edge series, which focused on sales. 
I decided that it was just as important, perhaps even more so, that we had a networking book that was designed to help us as introverts dominate in the networking room and in online networking that was specifically written for us. So if you're an introvert, don't delay. Head to theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking to get access to the first chapter of my new book completely for free today.